Good morning. Good morning. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, Sunday school, 10 15 on Sunday mornings, and then next week the adults will be starting the uh, the series of discussions that uh, we you had the bulletin insert for a few weeks. Uh, so we will start meeting in the sanctuary 10 15 next Sunday uh, for the adults. Um, as far as other announcements, the pulpit community committee, we have a meeting after church today. Um, just clarity what we're going to be discussing, probably working on a survey that will lead out to members, just kind of figuring out who we are as a church and what we want moving forward. So uh, keep an eye on that for the upcoming week. But that's, I think that's the main goal for today is get that worked out. Um, CWF had a really good meeting on Wednesday from what I hear. Uh, they have a couple things that they want to kind of put in your radar. It looks like in June, a Friday in June, I've been told. Uh, looks like they're going to look into attending a Reds game at the church. So uh, kind of just start looking at your calendar and see if we can make that work. Have an outing as a congregation and a family together. Um, if you know anybody that's interested in church camp, looks like K through 12, uh, they don't have to be a member of the church to go to church camp. So if you know anybody with children that want to be a part of it, there's information on the bulletin board in the fellowship hall. Uh, any other announcements? Let us take a moment and enter into prayer. Lord God, we need a sign today. Like Jesus changing water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, we need a sign today. Oh God, we are tired. We're tired of the hurts of this world. We are discouraged in the face of injustice power struggles, poverty, and indifference. We need a sign today, Lord. We know of your steadfast love like a mighty mountain will not be moved. And so we lean into your rock solidness. And we pray that we will feel comfort and gain steady footing and take a moment to rest in your strength and shade. Oh God, we know your gifts are many, as many as the grains of sand on a beach they cannot be counted. And we look to you to learn how to use the gifts that you have shared with each of us. And we pray that we might use them to bring your kingdom here and now. Lord God, your words are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May we live by them and let them guide each step of our journey. Lord God, crown us with your love. Show us your glory that in you we are continuously moved to acts of kindness, love, justice, and mercy. Because, Lord, we need a sign today. Oh 
God, we pray this prayer. And we pray the silent prayers from our hearts. You know our pain, our longings, our hopes. Oh God, hear our prayers. Amen. I invite you to hear these words, and if you are joining us from home, you are invited to uh, visit butlerchristian.com where you can give online as well. Typically, when we come to this moment in worship, we often try uh, rationally to encourage generosity um, for giving from each person. When we look at the story of Jesus and his mom at the wedding feast, we see that it's his mother that pushes Jesus into an act of generosity even if it's trying to get his mom off his back. And so I invite you to hear this uh, contemporary poet who makes sense of this story in this way. This Jewish mother knew the score. She knew her son could do much more than just sit back all uninvolved. And so this ponderer resolved that she'd weigh in and speak her mind, e'en though this son of hers unkindly snapped. Sometimes you need a push to get yourself up off your tush. And if that's true of even God, perhaps for you, it's not so odd. So consider this our push to get up off our tush and give generously so that we can take from the abundance of our lives and make life abundant for others. Giving God thank you for challenging us this day to get up and to move. Please accept these gifts and inspire each of us towards true generosity each and every day. Amen. So on this third Sunday in January, we come to this table of remembrance. We come filled with a gratitude for the ministry and mission of Jesus. We celebrate all who have decided to follow Jesus with their lives. And today, Today, we lift up the extraordinary ministry of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who challenged Christians everywhere to practice justice, not revenge, and bless others rather than curse them. So as we prepare to eat this bread and drink from this cup, let us join with, with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to act out our faith, preparing to bless others as we live in Jesus' light and love. Let us recall, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hatred cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So come, all of you and follow Jesus. Join with MLK and all the company of those who are Jesus's disciples as we share in this meal of light and love. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord, and for the opportunity to come together and worship you for the sacrifices that were made to make that possible. Lord, I pray we be with each and every one as we go through our week and pray when we're faced with challenges, we rise above and we can show what your love truly is to someone that may not know it. Lord, bless this loaf as it represents Christ's body that was broken on the cross so that we may have everlasting life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
And so I share with you what has been handed on to me, that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to each of his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are again thankful for this day. We are thankful for the opportunity that we have to come around this play table. To take of this cup, which represents Christ's blood, who gave up his life on the cross of Calvary, so we may have life and have it everlasting. Father, we ask you to take of this cup that we will not only remember the pain and the suffering of the cross, but the joy of the resurrection that gives us that opportunity for life. We thank we ask in Christ's name. Amen. And likewise, after supper, he took a cup, and he blessed it, and he said, Take and drink, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you come together, do this in remembrance of me. If you would like to join with me as we read from our scripture this morning, the Gospel according to John, chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern of that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who, drew, who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Sometimes it's hard to tell what time it is. There's all kinds of time. I wonder how the church tells time. Some say that time is like a line. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But this could be the beginning, and this could be the ending, or this could be the beginning, and this could be the ending. It's hard to tell beginnings and endings when time is a line. I know. Let's take the beginning that could be the ending and the ending that could be the beginning and tie them together. So now the beginning is the ending and the ending is the beginning. This is how the church tells time. This is the church puzzle. It can help us figure out how the church tells time.
We start with the three special days. We have Christmas, Easter, and ooh, it's hot like fire, Pentecost. There are all these purple Sundays, all the white Sundays, and all the green Sundays. See if we can put this back together. We start with the three special days. Christmas goes about here. Easter about there. And Pentecost, let's place it about here. Christmas is the day that we celebrate Jesus' birth and that God became a person. Christmas is so special that it takes four Sundays to get ready. Purple is the color for getting ready. We call this time before Christmas Advent. Advent is the, the end of the old church year and the beginning of the new one. So let's place them here at the beginning that is the ending, and the ending that is the beginning. We have one, two, three, and four. The next special Sunday is Easter. Easter is a time that we celebrate um, that Jesus died, but it is still with us that God made it so Jesus is still with us. Easter is so special that it takes six Sundays to get ready. And since purple is the color for getting ready, we need six purple Sundays in front of Easter. One, two, three, four, five, Six. On Easter, we are so happy that Jesus is still with us that we just have to celebrate Easter for six more Sundays. White is the color for Easter. So we're going to put six white blocks after Easter. One, two, three, four, five, and six. They go all the way to Pentecost, the day that we celebrate the mystery of God's gift to the Holy Spirit so that the church could say and do the amazing things that Jesus did. Now we have all these green Sundays. The green Sundays connect the East Christmas time with the Easter time. The most we can have in between here is nine. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All the rest go after Pentecost.
These words can help us to remember what time it is of the church calendar. Advent, the time we get ready to celebrate the mystery of Christmas. Epiphany, the time when we celebrate how God is made known to the whole world. Lent, the time when we get prepared for Easter. Easter, the time we celebrate that Jesus died, but is still with us. And Pentecost, when we celebrate God's gift of the Holy Spirit, so the church can say and do the amazing things Jesus did. These markers help to point to the three special Sundays of Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. And that is how the church tells time. So as you can see, we've entered into a green time of year, one of the nine weeks until we enter into Lent. So about a decade ago, <clears throat> I was uh, talking with a group of ministry colleagues from all over the country. At that time, I was participating in something called the Bethany Fellowship, which is um, a gathering of young clergy people from all across the country. And uh, one of my colleagues was from California and was talking about a new fundraiser that their church had started. It was a fundraiser designed to support the building of water wells all over the world. The congregation where my colleagues served was near wine country in California. And they decided to have a wine into water event. The congregation hosted a wine tasting once a month, inviting one of the local wine producers to feature their products. Tickets were sold and the funds helped cover the cost of the event, but also whatever was earned was then given to Week of Compassion and other nonprofits in their efforts to uh, help provide clean drinking water to those uh, communities in the world that need that help. God gives us what we need not only to survive, but to thrive. If we keep our eyes open, our minds open, and our hearts open. The lectionary reading bounces back to the Gospel according to John this week to hear the story of the first sign of Jesus' ministry in John. Now some people call this sign a sign and some people call this a miracle. Whatever we call it, what matters most is what it represents. Now I know that for every woman here, especially with male children, the fact that Jesus did what he was told to do on the second time asked is the miracle. <laughs> Seriously, though, Jesus and his family were attending a wedding, and it's pretty normal. It's a normal thing to do. Weddings were a community event, and everyone in the community was invited. And as the steward in the story tells the groom, hosts always served the best wine first and waited for everyone to be in a festive mood before they changed things up to the less expensive wine when people didn't care anymore. And do you know that the worst thing that can happen is to run out of something at a party? 
You know that you, if you've ever hosted a party, you're always concerned if you have enough. It could be really embarrassing if you happen to run out. And so Mary tells Jesus to help prevent the hosts from embarrassment. And so Jesus turns several gallons of water into wine. The sign, the miracle that took place is that God gives us everything we need to live in abundance. More than likely, we will never have all of the money and the material comforts we would like. But we certainly have everything that we need to live comfortably. And we have friends and we have family and communities of faith where we love others and are loved in return. Relationships where we matter to another person. Life abundant. And in appreciation for the abundance in our lives and in an effort to follow the actions and teachings of Jesus, we give of our abundance so that others can live abundantly too. Back in 2008, I was invited by Week of Compassion to travel to Central Europe, to the country of Bosnia, where Week of Compassion had been present for about a decade at that point in time. The Balkan War, sometimes called the Yugoslav War, started after the breakup of the former Yugoslavia and the, the collapse of the former USSR. Bosnia was and is an ethnically and religiously diverse nation, primarily of Roman Catholic, Eastern Catholic, Jews and Muslims. For centuries, Bosnia dwelled in peace. As the former Yugoslavia broke apart, the newly independent nations began to vie for power in the region and, and religious nationalism began to take over. The Roman Catholics of Croatia and the Eastern Catholics of Serbia began fighting one another. And soon they joined forces identifying a common enemy and focused on the annihilation of the remaining Jewish population and the Muslims of Bosnia. Forced death marches, mass killings and graves, assault on women to impregnate them. A nation was torn apart and devastated. The Dayton Accord was signed in 1996 and brought a tenuous peace. But still the Bosnian people remained and were left with little or nothing. Week of Compassion entered in along with its many non-governmental partnerships to bring emergency relief. By the time I visited in 2008, Bosnia was past the need for emergency relief and well along the way of working towards more self-reliance. Week of Compassion had been a long-term partner and so we met with some of the people that Week of Compassion directly impacted. We met with a group of farmers who knew that they could become self-sustainable and self-reliant if they only had a cooler to store all of their milk and wait for it to be picked up by a large truck. And so Week of Compassion helped them obtain a milk cooler. We met with a family that lived near these gorgeous spring-fed streams, and they had fruit trees, and they jam, they made jams and jarred and, and sold them in the local market, and they knew that if they could just have a concrete pool, they could farm trout and become more self-reliant and provide a reliable food source for their community. 
And so Week of Compassion helped them build that concrete pool. But one group of women that we got to sit down with for a meal is what has stuck with me most these last many years. As we drove down this pothole street and climbed up to the second story of this bullet hole pockmarked building, we were immediately met with warmth and incredible smells that were mouth-watering. We were invited into a room where chairs and benches were set around the side. They were covered in blankets and pillows, and there was a huge table in the middle covered in home-cooked food. Roasted chickens and sausages and home-baked bread, fresh salads and veggies from the garden, and homemade baklava. And we ate and we laughed, and the women began telling us some of their stories. The women shared with us that they were a collective that had started many years before with the help of Week of Compassion. Almost all of them had lost their husbands in the war, and almost all of them had lost their grown male children. And Bosnia is still a very uh, traditional society. Men work outside the home, women work inside the home. And so many did not have a way to earn any income. And many were expecting children they hadn't planned for. And so the women came together and they began making handicrafts. And they supported one another, they listened to the stories and they cried, and ultimately they helped each other raise these children. I was a young student, I had very little money, and really for a 12 day trip I had about $150 in cash. That's part naivete and part I was broke. I watched as my trip mates bought handicrafts from these women and beautiful, beautiful stoles that had been hand embroidered, not this one, but like it, uh, socks and gloves and all sorts of things that had been made. And I wanted to buy something, but I was so scared of running out of money during my trip. And as we concluded our time together, we began to say our goodbyes and started walking out the door. And this woman touched my arm and I turned around and she handed me a pair of woolen socks. And I said, no, 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 I can't, I can't take that. I, I can't pay for them. And she said, no, 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 listen. You take them and you pay for them because you tell my story so that other people know that we survive. My eyes filled with tear, and this woman who had survived God knows what gave me a gift out of her abundance. Not her financial abundance, but of her love, her appreciation, her perseverance, her time, her grace. I have no idea what that woman's name is. I don't know if she's Christian, Muslim, or Jewish, but it doesn't matter because in her I saw the face of God. And to this day, that gift means more to me than just about any other gift I've ever been given. And so I tell her story. And I tell their story, and I tell how that when we give to organizations like Week of Compassion, we help others live abundantly. It's amazing what can be accomplished when we live out of a place of faith, a place of acknowledgement of our abundance, what we can do. I was living in a place of fear 
and in a place of not having enough, and I was given a gift from abundance. When we live in a place of fear, a fear of not having enough, we forget our faith. We forget that God has given each of us more than enough. That God has given us more than enough to survive. That God has given us what we need to live abundantly and thrive. And so we thank God. Amen. If you have heard something here this morning that calls you to want to recommit your faith, to remember your baptism, then you're invited to come forward during this time. If you would like to confess your faith or profess your faith for the first time, you're invited to do so during this time as well. As we prepare to go from this place, let us not live in fear of never having enough. The Lord God has given us more than enough to survive, but to thrive. So as we go from this place, let us go living abundantly and giving to those so that they too can live abundantly. Amen.